Feast TV is brought to you with support from Missouri Wines, Chef's Shop, and Whole Foods Market. Welcome to the Tastemakers edition of Feast TV. This month, you are going to meet some of the St. Louis region's most innovative people that are working in the culinary world. And in between each one of the segments, I'm going to be making a winter souffle. The recipe was developed by Lucy Schwetti for our menu options column. And if you've never made souffle before, you're gonna see that it is easy and something that you can make for even a weeknight side dish. In this episode, we're putting the spotlight on Nick Ludi over at the Libertine. Then we'll meet Jason and Adam Tilford at Mission Taco Joint in the Loop. We're chatting with Scott Carey over at Sump Coffee, and then we're wrapping things up with David Bailey and bringing you to the soft opening of Small Batch in Midtown. Now this winter souffle is a perfect side dish with roast beef or roasted lamb. And so the wine that we're highlighting today is Norton. Now this is our beloved state grape. It has a rich and incredibly full aroma and flavor. So before I get into this cooking demo, let's head to the Libertine in Clayton where a former St. Louisan came home from Chicago to open a new neighborhood eatery. I always looked at St. Louis as a great place to raise family, have kids. I hadn't been back in quite some time, was a little apprehensive about being able to do exactly what we wanted to do in town. It was affordable, it was accessible, the community seemed really great, and as I reached out, you know, I did a little research and I realized, you know, St. Louis is really right for what we want to do, and it's just a matter of finding the right location and then executing it. So we moved down here, my wife and I, and made a run. <music> Initially, you know, it was a suggestion of uh, Mark Brennan, who was my commercial real estate broker. He knew Josh pretty well and said, after talking to you, I think you guys would get along. So he kind of put us together and Josh and I went out and had some coffee, talked. And we realized right away that we were pretty like-minded with what we wanted to do and how we wanted to execute everything. Basically, I mean, it was a, an opportunity to kind of start something new, but at the same time, it was the, very much the freedom to do what I want to do essentially looked at each other like, okay, let's just do this. We shook hands and we went forward. It was nice to kind of find that common ground, you know? It's been great. I mean, him and I work together really well. It's pretty easy working with uh, what may be the, one of the best chefs in, you know, the U.S., you know, so that's a pretty easy relationship to have. Well, it was pretty shocking, um, you know, coming out of Chicago, it's very competitive and there isn't that same sort of camaraderie that, that you'll find. There's a handful of people that are really friends, but you know, it's not like that here. Soon restaurateurs and friends all sort of seem to come out of the woodwork. Our executive chef, Josh Galliano, once he came on board with us, um, I started to see that there were other relationships that he already had with other restaurateurs and chefs and other foodies and people all throughout. Um, and they sort of came in and they, they, were, they really embraced us. They, they seemed to got, get what we're doing and as we've developed and as we've grown, they've really helped us out a lot. So when I was developing the idea for the Libertine, what I was really trying to do is come up with a restaurant that my wife and I just simply wanted to eat at. It's kind of a, a freedom to kind of let creative juices flow and kind of make it within the framework that we're agreeing about. We want this to be a neighborhood place, a place that, you know, somebody could come three, four times a week have the same thing if they wanted to, not have the same thing, you know, but they felt comfortable when they were doing it and it didn't break their pocketbook. The kind of place where you could go out to eat on a Wednesday night, have a wonderful meal and not make it feel stuffy. I wanted the menu to be fun, uh, but that in itself, you can't write that in a business plan. You can't put that on the menu, you know, you don't have an item that says fun. Um, it's, it's the kind of thing where you, you hope that your esoteric sense of humor is understood or if it's not understood, at least it tastes really damn good. No matter how much I try and make the menu fun and approachable and accessible, I have to make sure that the servers are making it that way. That's a tough job to do, you know, you gotta hire the right people basically. 
At the end of the day, I want them to just smile. For them to say thank you is kind of like the most important thing for me, but that means that they enjoyed it, that they had a good time with it, they had a good experience, and for them to do that takes a lot of different types of preparation. I want them to just see the food, enjoy it, and have a good time with whoever they're with. I don't want them to think about the 50 other steps that went into putting the plate together. St. Louis is so diverse right now, and, and we're all developing these sort of fingerprints that over time all sort of collectively help define the city greatly. I think us, the Libertine, you know, we're, we're one of many that are just all these great restaurants, these great restaurateurs from Gerard and Kevin and us and all these other great people, all of us are working really hard trying to help in a lot of ways define the city. Look at all these people, and it's really impressive. I just love what Nick and Josh are doing over at the Libertine. I think it's one of the best new additions to the St. Louis food scene in a while. Now we're gonna get into our cooking demonstration and these are the vegetables that we're going to roast as the base of the souffle. This is a parsnip and yes, it looks like a white carrot, but it's not. It doesn't taste anything like a carrot, but it has a similar kind of a sweetness because obviously it is a root vegetable. You can see that it has kind of a starchier texture than a carrot does. Alrighty, now I'm gonna toss in five whole garlic cloves and you might be wondering what this is. It is not an alien, um, although it looks like one. This is a celery root and it smells like celery but not with that same kind of almost acidic uh, nature that the stalks have. It has a wonderful kind of fresh aroma to it and a flavor that you can't find pretty much anywhere else. So cut off the end and then the way that you peel this is you just run your knife down the bulb and get kind of the skin off. Now fennel, and I'm just gonna go ahead and cut the stalks off, and we're gonna just reserve these fennel fronds to garnish the souffle once it is fully roasted. And our good friend, the shallots. Love shallots. The best way to describe it is that it's a cross between garlic and an onion. Um, it has a little bit of the sweetness and sharpness of onion, but also a slight kind of garlicky flavor. I'm just coating this with grapeseed oil. I'm going to season it with salt and pepper and just roast it in the oven 400 degrees. So now let's meet two brothers who have successfully created a string of Mexican destinations. It's unfortunate to see what has happened to the Mexican cuisine in the United States, specifically our area in the Midwest, and there's just so much more that can be done with the ingredients they have, and it's just nice to, nice to be able to do that. First and foremost is the food. I mean, you have to have good food, and it has to be something different and unique, and I think each restaurant brings something different and unique. There's, uh, there's things at every restaurant that people are just love or talk about and want to tell their friends about, and that's important. You need to have some fun signature things that people get excited about. Uh, when we first opened Tortilla, area in the West End, we were right by Barnes Jewish Hospital. So the idea was to open a quick casual place where you know, not only can the hospital go and, and eat quickly for lunch, but that the local residents could find a nice place to you know, eat some good meals uh, in the evening. The signature items at Tortilleria, I would have to say, are the fish tacos. Uh, people come from all over to get them. We make our own tortillas, and that you start with a great tortilla, you're going to end up with a good taco. Uh, we use tilapia, um, and it's, you get either grilled or fried, and we make a beer batter uh, for the fried. And it's pretty much a traditional taco, fish taco, it's just when you use quality ingredients, you end up with quality product. I think we decided to open up 
is Milagro uh, after Tortilleria uh, really started gaining its popularity. Um, and people took to it so much that we decided, hey, if they're taking to this, which is just a good, solid Mexican restaurant, let's see if we can do the upscale thing. Let's see if we can take this to another, you know, another level. The, the best thing about cooking at Milagro is uh, the ability to go outside of the box even more than the other restaurants as far as the ingredients I work with. There I'll work with a snapper, fresh snapper, lobster, I'll work with scallops, um, we'll do, you know, ribeye steaks and, and Basically over there, it's, it's very, very chef driven um, as far as ingredients, preparation methods, um, a lot of traditional stuff, we get stuff in daily um, and everything's prepared from scratch uh, even, and it's more of a, a, a dining setting. At Milagro tonight, we're going to make the uh, cochinita pabil, which is a marinated roasted pork shoulder. It's cooked in a banana leaf um, and it's served with some hibiscus pickled onions and some, some mashed potatoes and our famous street corn. Really, mission isn't, we're not calling it a Mexican restaurant. It's a Mexicali cuisine. It's, it's, our, it's like a California take on Mexican food. Uh, and it allows us to do really cool, playful things that aren't traditional at all, like uh, tofu tacos um, and you know duck tacos and things like that. We knew we were going to do tacos heavily at mission. It was more of um, you know the family style a la carte tacos, how we're going to serve it, you know, we've changed even in the short time we've been here, we've made some changes to that. We are going to make our carne asada fries, which um, are inspired by a dish in, in San Diego, um, on the beaches there. Uh, what it is is basically nachos with french fries instead of chips. And it's basically going to be crispy fries topped with plancha chihuahua cheese, pico de gallo, and then our uh, guacamole, sour cream, and we have uh, our grilled flank steak that you're gonna see cooked over the wood grill. When you cook over the wood grill, it's, it's a very traditional cooking method and you can talk to chefs all over. The, the best flavor you get on grilling food is from, you know, wood. So we spark the fire up in the morning. It takes a good hour to get the thing going. It'll, it'll get up to about 1,500 to 2,000 degrees. Um, and then we let it cool down to about 600 degrees um, and try to hold it there all day. And we go through a lot of wood, but it's worth it. Um, and people really, comment on the flavor of the tacos. I, I talk about uh, you know how, working with my brother a bit and it's we are the best team ever. Uh, we are completely different people. He is the artistic talented one. I am the business numbers guy and we are an amazing team. I think I see a lot of people open restaurants and they have one component or the other and it's tough to make it work. I think what's really important with restaurants is to always be evolving. Just always know that you can be doing something better. Uh, never rest on your laurels, no matter how many awards you might win or people are in the door. Just always make sure that you're trying to learn something new and you're going to do well. So now, of course, I'm craving tacos, um, <laughs> but we're focusing and I am going to make a bechamel, which a couple of episodes ago, uh, actually the Thanksgiving episode, I taught you how to make bechamel. It's a very, very simple white sauce. We're just starting off with four tablespoons of butter. Butter is melted. Now I'm going to add in an equal amount of flour and that's how you make a roux, which is the basis of your white sauce, your bechamel. It's just equal parts fat to flour. This turns into a paste. I'm gonna add in a cup of milk. You can always add more milk, but you can't take it away. So start with a scant cup and build from there. Just whisk it in, making sure that you don't have any lumps from your roux. And this, as it cooks over medium low heat, will start to thicken and become ultra creamy. The bechamel is resting and now I'm just gonna whip up these egg whites. And we're going to whip these to the point where they are stiff peaks because all the little bubbles that are created by whipping egg whites are what is going to give the souffle its lift and that kind of beautiful rise that we all expect from a souffle. So before I move on to the next step, let's head over to Sump Coffee and meet an entrepreneur who is helping to define what it means to drink coffee here in St. Louis. So my light bulb moment with coffee, honestly, was around 2005, 2006. I was living in New York City. There was a, a coffee shop that opened. I wasn't a coffee nerd or anything like that. I went in, I got a latte to go, you know, and that's a gateway coffee, I think. 
And the guy was surly, tattooed, looked grumpy. He put it in a to-go cup and he put a little rosetta on it, put a lid next to it, didn't smile, didn't say anything. When I looked down and put the lid on the coffee, I saw that and I looked up like, what, what why, that's crazy. Why, I'm just gonna put this lid on it. And there was something about that coffee. It was, it was excellent. And so when I came to St. Louis, I didn't have, that, that experience wasn't available. There's lots of places that do coffee and food, but that experience of coming and getting a cup of coffee and sort of creating a dialogue with the person that's serving you and focusing on that one experience. So this is a new brewing device. It's only been on the market less than a year. It's an immersive brewing device. It kind of works on a, a vacuum or a siphon filter. So what you're gonna get and why you would brew this way, you're gonna get a little bit more body in the cup. So what that means is a little more weight on the palate, what I'll call flavor clarity and brightness, which is what we try and kind of go after in the shop. Some people will come in and they'll, they'll order an Americano. And we don't make that, we don't make it for various reasons, but automatically people are defensive because they don't understand. You know, if they ordered a Frappuccino and we don't have blenders, they understand that but they don't understand why we can't put hot water in espresso. Honestly, uh, it's more of a philosophical thing. It's kind of a wine thing. You know, you don't put a little bit of water in wine. That's a lot of what we do to model what we do here. I understand, you know, people will say, well, I get an Americano because I know it's fresh or whatever. Well, you can watch me grind your cup and make it fresh. So those arguments are somewhat disarmed here in the shop, but that is, that is a challenge. And it would certainly be easy just to fold and say, yeah, I'll put hot water in that. But it's again, it's trying to present just the entire suite of what we do in a uniform way. When we come down in the shop in the morning, what we do is we dial in the espresso. So these are the things we keep track of and so hopefully understand that what we tasted when we wrote that down is going to go across the counter throughout the day. And if something changes, then we know we have a problem and we need to redial in what we do just to make sure that the quality is still there. We roast light to highlight what we call the origin or the processing notes. So we're not buying commodity coffee. Commodity coffee is probably sold for about a buck fifteen right now. We're paying four, five, eight, sometimes twenty-five dollars a pound. Essentially, there are no local coffee farmers, but you can still respect those choices, in my opinion, by roasting the coffee light. So you can tell where a coffee comes from and you can tell how it's processed better, in my opinion, my palate opinion, than if you roast something dark. What I think's happening in the market that makes places like Sump or any local eatery or restaurant, people start to realize the alternative. It's that connection to craft and purpose or they like to come to a place like that because it feels unique and special. Trying to develop trust of the individuals that come in here, um, I guess we take a little bit of a non-traditional approach. If you come into a space that feels a little bit foreign, a little bit unfamiliar, you have to enter into a dialogue. So how we begin that dialogue is by, you know, not having any signage, not having a menu board, not having anything. So you have to essentially approach somebody behind the counter, such as myself, and then we highlight the menu and we engage in a discussion. And, you know, we say, this is our offering, and we ask them kind of, what do you like? What do you usually drink? What do you order out? And hopefully we impress them such that that trust is earned then at that moment. Uh, alternatively, you get people that are a little more adventurous and kind of like that experience, kind of like that curated experience, and will go outside their comfort zone. And by engaging in that dialogue based on the menu, that's how we start to develop trust, and then hopefully we follow through by delivering an exceptional experience. I am always impressed when I talk to Scott Carey. He has a real clarity of vision, and I think it takes a lot of um, trust in yourself to open a place where you intentionally challenge your consumer. I think it's very exciting what he's doing. 
um, over there on Jefferson Avenue. So these are our root vegetables. They've been roasted, as you can see, they're nicely caramelized, and I'm just gonna put these into the food processor and give them a quick whirl. Now this obviously is a winter vegetable puree, but if you want to do this in fall or spring or summer, you can substitute other vegetables that are right for the season. So don't feel like this is something that you can only make when parsnips and celery root are at their best. All right, we're gonna let this go. And then just add a little bit of vegetable stock. And if all you have on hand is chicken stock, that's totally fine. Looks pretty good. It almost looks like hummus or baba ganoush in a way. You can kind of see the texture here. It does have some chunk to it, but it's not gonna be so much that it's gonna interfere with that light texture of the souffle. Okie doke, so we're gonna take the vegetable puree and just add it into a large mixing bowl because all of our ingredients are gonna go in here at the end. We're gonna add in, these are just five of the yolks from the eggs that we separated. Mix that in. And you wanna make sure to mix very thoroughly in this recipe so that everything is evenly distributed. The Gruyere goes in next. Gruyere is traditional in souffles. Um, it's a, a really nice kind of pungent cheese. You could use another cheese if you like, but if you want to go with kind of a classic flavor, I would stick with the Gruyere. Kept this on low heat just so that it kind of stays warm, because if you turn it off, it'll kind of get gloppy on you, which you don't want to have happen. I'm gonna add just a little bit in and stir that. Now we're gonna add in the egg whites, and this is where people get really nervous, but don't be afraid. We're gonna do one third at a time, and you just fold it in. The texture of this has completely changed. Like, it's almost foamy, which is exactly what you're looking for. And I have already prepared these ramekins with just a little bit of butter and then coated the butter with um, just some breadcrumbs. And this will keep it from sticking, essentially. So I'm gonna finish filling these and then pop them into a 400 degree oven. And while I do, let's head over and meet David Bailey. He is an entrepreneur who has opened a string of successful restaurants. And we're going to take you to the soft opening of Small Batch his latest endeavor in Midtown. Well, it was in my childhood day. Oh, Lord. I want to create something that will last and has uh, a particular meaning and, and says something about the city that I live in, about the people that live in this city, and will be a place to, to bring those people together. The vegetarian restaurant has been one we wanted for quite a long time. When I knew that we were going to do a vegetarian restaurant and I wanted to decide what we were going to do for the counterpoint focus with the, with the bar, whiskey was a natural choice um, because it doesn't make sense on paper but it makes sense in, you know, in, in action. Being able to take things that are seemingly disparate and put them together creates a, you know, an actual storyline uh, and a way to have something for more people to, to be interested in and be excited about coming to, to try. As with all of my other menus, you, know, you, you wanna have an arc to it, you wanna have a, a, a completed thought to it. So each dish is thought about in relation to the bar as well. Um, and then we're crossing over the bar into the menu as well by doing different infusions, different liqueurs and tinctures and, and bitters and things like that. So we can actually bring some of the kitchen into the bar and that completes the storyline. There are a few main reasons to do a soft opening. You wanna get everybody accustomed to working in the space and understanding kind of where their body is in relation to the tables, where the plates go on the table, which direction everything's supposed to point, where's seat one, you know, all those little details that hopefully the customer will never even know about or, you know, or notice. If you don't mind, I want to welcome you to Small Batch, and I'm going to run through the, uh, the dinner that we're going to have for the soft opening this evening. 
So you're gonna start with an amuse-bouche of uh, quick pickled whiskey soaked carrots. So a little taste of cumin, a little whiskey, and a little vinegar and soy to get the palate kind of awakened. So the gougere with winter rolls, uh, as well as house-made burrata, which is a fresh mozzarella wrapped around uh, fresh-made ricotta with a little lemon zest and olive oil. After that, we'll move on to uh, uh, our version of pho. So instead of a beef broth, it'll be a rich vegetarian broth with a uh, mushroom wonton. And then we'll move on to the pasta part of the menu with uh, uh, a gnocchi course as well as a carbonara. Uh, and then finish it off with ice cream. And you'll notice throughout the meal, uh, everything is made in-house. All the sauces, all of the breads, everything down to anything we can possibly make uh, as soon as it comes out of the ground. One of the things I love about you know, the Bailey restaurants is, one, they're, they're visually stunning and they're all very unique. But two, the food, it, it doesn't cater to the lowest common denominator. It caters to people that love food and celebrate food and drink. And you know, it's not it has to be all highbrow and expensive or anything to be delicious and interesting. These restaurants, their staff is absolutely amazing, and obviously that's really important. They make you want to return to the restaurants. And it's not just that, it's, it's the ambiance. Each restaurant is just a special place to be at. Anytime I'm opening a restaurant, I'm trying to create a dialogue between myself and the customer. I guess the creative process of the restaurants and having the, the different types is just sort of my way of welcoming other people into my, into my world and hoping that, you know, I get welcomed into theirs. And that really then drives me to make sure that the space and the food and the drink and everything else, else that goes along with it provides the full dialogue with that other person. What a restaurant is to me is a way to honor other people, um, to have respect for human beings, um, because you know, to me, this is it's a noble profession. Because, I mean, how lucky are you to get to feed people? You know, to get to um, provide satisfaction to to somebody. Given the opportunity to take that, you know, to elevate that and make it a, a pleasurable thing and something that is not just a need is amazing. Who knew that there would be a vegetarian whiskey focused restaurant in St. Louis? If anybody is going to bring a concept that is that cutting edge to this city, it is David Bailey. So ta-da, it's really not difficult to make as you can see. It is something that if you um, have a sweet or a savory base and treat all of your ingredients in, in the right way, you're gonna end up with um, a beautifully risen souffle. And just to kind of show you the texture when it comes out, you'll see that it kind of pulls away a little bit from the edge of the ramekin. And it's just that fluffy goodness inside. Absolutely delicious. Now I am going to pair this souffle with some roasted lamb and nothing is a better pair with lamb than Norton, which again is our state grape. And this wine is from St. James, which is close to the middle of the state and they make fantastic Missouri wines. So cheers to all of the wonderful tastemakers that are doing exciting stuff here in St. Louis and I'll see you next month.